Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Deconstructing My Facade question and answer presentation, Jesus answers questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, Deconstructing My Facade. Recorded on the 7th of June 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Okay, so deconstructing my facade, question and answers. Let's get started. So we start Pete down the front. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. And uh, yep. um, I've got a question about the interplay with family emotions in the facade. Yeah. So the example I've got, um, if I've got rejection down in my pain, and then I have a rule that, you know, I want to avoid a rejection at all cost. Yeah. So then I create the facade of superiority and arrogance with the rule being when rejected, it's someone else's fault. Yep. I'm not sure then how, like, then I have an interplay with my family emotion group that I'm arrogant and superior as a family. Yeah. How do they affect each other? Well, up here in the addiction where you're saying, it's okay for me to feel like somebody else's fault when I feel like I'm rejected. Yeah. Um, then basically what you've got to do is start addressing, well, why do you feel that's okay? Yeah. What, 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 what feelings inside of you cause you to believe that's okay? To blame someone else for your feeling. So, so up here in the one, of the, one of the demands, one of the demands of the addiction is, other people are responsible for my feelings. That's one of the false beliefs up here. Okay. You're responsible for how I feel. Yep. And yeah. particularly in a partnership, we see that a lot, right? Where, where, where one person or both parties feel the other person is yeah. responsible for how they feel. So if I feel bad, it's your fault. You, you said something to me, made me feel bad, so it's your fault. And, and it's not their fault. It's a feeling in you. But the justification of it being their fault which is occurring up here, needs to be addressed. So why do you feel, what, what's the underlying belief systems up here that cause you to justify <coughs> to yourself that it's their fault? Because that's what's wrong. Yeah. So once you, start, once you stop justifying here that it's their fault, then you'll just go, oh, I feel rejected still. Yeah. It's still a feeling, you feel rejected, but you won't say it's their fault anymore. So the that arrogance and superiority you have with that mm -hmm. then if you have this overall arrogance and superiority in you does it start to crack that one at the same time well it does because arrogance is driven by this belief of superiority follow yeah and superiority partly can be a pain-based emotion but it can also be justified through the actions we take gotcha. so so up here the actions are like i'm allowed to think i'm superior I'm allowed to say that you're to blame for something I feel. These, are, these allowances are occurring up here, is what I'm suggesting, not down here. Not down there. Yeah, the pain is I just feel really shitty and bad and I just, you know, once I connect to it, I'll feel it. You know, I'll feel rejected. I'll feel the rejection and even where it came from then. But I'm not even going to get there while up here I'm blaming everybody yeah. who, whenever I feel rejected, I just blame the person who I feel rejected me. Yep. That's not, that's not addressing the emotion at all. And in that place, as you know, that's when you have fights, arguments, you know, and it just gets, gets way out of line then. It's like <laughs> everyone's at each other and in a relationship after that point. Yeah, it's not very nice. And that's because, see, see fights, arguments, that's all up here too. I'm fighting. Why am I fighting? It's because I have a belief that I'm allowed to fight. I'm allowed to just fight anybody who doesn't agree with me. I'm allowed to attack them. I'm allowed to abuse them. I'm allowed to pull them down. I'm allowed to make them feel bad about themselves. I'm allowed to do all of those things because up here I've got a feeling that I'm just allowed to. I'm allowed to get, I should get away with it. If you loved me, you'd put up with it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's all of these addictions, belief systems that need to be deconstructed. That makes sense? Phoebe, straight behind you. Um, as you've been talking uh, before, I was thinking a lot about what Sonia was saying in the channeling about how yes. um, that awesome channeling yep. about how when we give up, we start giving up some addictions, but not feeling through them. Yeah. 
and I'm noticing like that feels like what I'm doing in my life. Like I still want them. Yeah. But and then it just becomes this hopeless feeling. You feel like you want them, but you're not allowed to have them, but you can't it. process the emotion of them. And yeah. It's just like, yeah. So yeah. my question, I guess, is: Is that hopeless, yuck feeling? Is that another? addiction yeah. that needs to be processed. What does hopelessness gain you? It gains you not having to act, not having to do something about it, not having to actually address the actual problem. Yeah. Makes you feel, hopelessness gets you out of dealing with anything. In fact, you can just go, oh, it's all hopeless anyway, I might as well give up. Yeah. And that's what you want. You want to give up so you don't have to address those issues, you see. And is it also a bit of like a compensation type feeling or is it purely well, not addiction? at that stage, no. Okay. It's just all the addiction it's in just play. another really. it's technique just, of... Yeah, just yeah. technique after technique. Like I said, we're just weaselly, conniving little things, you know. Like, <laughs> it's like we'll try one thing after another. We will. Yes. And, and, and up here, you know, we've got to see the sin of that. This is about awakening to the sin, right? So late, like we had a recent, myself and Mary had a discussion probably last year sometime I think it was about awakening to sin. I can't remember when it was now. But anyway, <laughs> it was sometime last year and we had a discussion about awakening to sin. And in that discussion, this is what we're meaning. Like we need to go through this process where we see the justifications for our sin. We see what we're doing to justify what we do wrong. Right now, pain doesn't justify sin. It's it's up here that does that, the addictions that do that. We can we can have pain and not justify sin. Mm. Mm. Okay, could I ask another question? Sure, you can. It's not related, but um, so if I am to understand correctly, we're not going to feel any pain until we feel some terror of the pain. Oh, like, you might you might know it's there and you might feel little dribbles of it here and there, but right. you cover it over pretty rapidly because the terror is saying use the facade to cover it over. So, for example, like say in the group setting, there's been times where people have connected to emotions and you guys have sort of confirmed that that's what's happening, but uh, maybe not, no terror is being felt, but there's... Is that, is that pain? That bit? Where's that feeling? No, a lot of times they're connecting to these emotions. Okay, yeah. That's okay because they are emotional, aren't they? They're going to have to be felt. Yeah. And it's actually an awakening to humility, mm. isn't it, that's occurring. So that's good. So, yeah, we, it's fine that they feel those emotions. But, but actually feeling your pain, you're not going to be able to be in this room. Uh, okay, yeah. You're just not. You, you'll be home probably not, not even be able to be here for a day if you were feeling your pain. Yeah, so there's just feelings all through this process. I think I've got in my head like everything I feel up until that point is kind of bad, not right, it's but not it's true. not true. Yeah, because you need to feel to get to the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is one thing I feel that many of you have not realised either. You, you're still trying to select feelings rather than seeing that feelings are the way to get to solution of these issues, but you're not uh, also not understanding the feelings that are involved. Up here, for many of you, the feelings involved are, I feel like I'm justified, and that's not the feeling. That's the, that's the excuse. That's the, that's the justification. You need to find why you feel you're justified. That's up here, which might be, I'm allowed to blame you for my problems. I'm allowed to not take responsibility. I'm allowed to, you know, love, love tells me that I, you know, well, my addictions tell me, you give me what I want, and I'll, uh, I'll give you what you want and everything's going to be fine. Your addictions tell you that, but once you're in your pain, the pain doesn't tell you that. The pain just says, you know, I'm not fine. I'm not going to be able to get what I want. And, and it's good that I'm not getting what I want. And you cry about the fact that there's a whole heap of things you wanted that you never got, maybe. In your childhood, of course. Or the pain might be completely opposite. It might be having to cry about the fact that there's, you know, you were taught in your young childhood that you could get anything you want whenever you wanted it. And this is a problem in the Western world. It's a huge problem where most of us have been taught that we're allowed to get anything we want when we want it. And that is not true from God's perspective. Because if you want sinful things, you shouldn't get them. <laughs> right? 
So, yeah, there's things we need to learn in that place, Phoebe, and, and this is why this pace is so critical to the developing and awakening to the humility. Without going through deconstruction, you're not going to become humble. Just not. And humility is a subsequent result of coming to terms with all of these unloving motivations, which are not driven by pain. You've been telling yourself, many of you, that they are, and they're not. They're driven by choice. They're driven by choices that are out of harmony with love. They're not driven by pain. I can have pain and still not make choices out of harmony with love. And I can also have no pain and still make choices out of harmony with love. First human couple, good example of that. No pain, made a choice out of harmony with love. You can do either. Right? So you've got to stop justifying to yourself that pain is the justification for the choices. It's not. The justification for choices happen up here, happen in this place where you feel justified making, taking unloving actions and choosing unloving things to do. Cho you know, decisions you make are critical to your future welfare. From a soul perspective, decisions you make are critical. And the decisions we're making up here are all very unloving decisions. I can expect you to do whatever I want. I can demand that you do whatever I want. If I give you a nice feeling, you should give me a nice feeling in return. These are all unloving demands in this, in this addictive phase that we're in. Does that make sense? And they have to be deconstructed. The reason for them has to be removed. And only I can do it for me. And only you can do it for you. God's love isn't going to do it. God's love isn't going to do it. Because you need to do it before you receive God's love on a lot of issues. Yeah. It's a decision you have to make. The awakening to sin, something has to be done for myself. Thanks. Yep. If we come to Chris and if we go up back to Jane. Um, I was wondering if you mentioned hopelessness, whether hopelessness can be both uh, an addiction emotion and also a causal emotion. It can, but it's highly unlikely if you've not accepted your facade that it's a causal emotion. See, see what I'm suggesting to you is if the process is, number one, you, you've got the creation of your pain. And remember, we've been through this process. You've got creation of pain. And then you've got creation of your facade. And then you've got acceptance of your facade. And then you've got deconstruction of your facade. And this process here, these two things, you could call the awakening to sin. Right? And then you've got releasing pain. That's the process, right, that we're taking you through. Now, if you're feeling hopeless and you haven't accepted your facade, then your hopelessness is a, is a rage-based hopelessness, an anger-based hopelessness, driven by the desire to not do something, driven by the desire to not act. And that is in your facade. You follow? So a lot of people are trying to say, oh, I feel real hopeless because of some pain-based thing. But if you haven't accepted your facade and deconstructed your facade, you've got no idea what it is because of. Does that make sense? Mm. You're just telling yourself a story that it's that so that you can avoid this. Right? And you've got to be very careful of that. These are self-delusional emotions that we've talked about times before and you've got to be very careful about using them as justifications and using them saying that I'm actually dealing with some pain when the reality is you're not. Now, sure, in your childhood there are times when you were a young child and no matter what you did, you got punished. They're quite extreme events when no matter what you did, you got punished. So you did a good thing, you got punished, you did a bad thing, you got punished. And that is certainly going to cause a feeling of hopelessness inside of you as a causal emotion. 
but, but you're not going to get there yet if you haven't accepted and deconstructed your facade. And so if you're hopeless, feeling hopeless, and you haven't done these two things, then it's hopelessness in the facade. It's not hopelessness in the pain. So see? I'm not going to know either way until I come to accept your my facade. facade first and then get to the place where I can deconstruct it. Correct. Then I will know either way. Correct. And you'll probably find that both exist. Okay. You'll probably find that both exist in the end. But, but the hopelessness that you choose to have in your facade is all about avoidance. Okay. It's all about weaseling out of something. It's all about not taking action. That's, that's a different kind of hopelessness, which is motivated from a different motivation okay. than the hopelessness you feel here when you feel that. You'll just cry about the fact that when you were a little child and in that situation, you had no choice and no matter what you did, it was wrong and you got punished for it. That's what you'll be crying okay. here. Very different. Yeah. Right. And we, we tell ourselves all sorts of things. We tell ourselves all sorts of things and we've got to be real careful. If you haven't gone through the okay. acceptance and deconstruction process, then the hopelessness you're feeling is related to those processes. So Very simple. Basically, at the moment, I just haven't got a clue. Yeah. And I just have to be with that and yeah. go through the process. Yeah. And it's okay. Yeah. See, if you're not judgmental, that's okay. Yeah. So now, if you think about many of the presentations I've given over years now, I've been saying to many of you, you haven't got a clue yet. And you've been going, what does he mean? You haven't got a clue? I've been listening for years. Of course I've got a clue, right? I know what he's talking about. And this is why I'm saying you don't have okay. a clue yet because, because you've not understood the processes you're going to go through yet because you're stuck at this one. Stuck there. Yeah. Not going to feel that one, and as a result, you don't know what yeah. these emotions are about yet. To to know, you've got to accept yeah. first that you do what you do, and then find the reasons. So deconstructing the facade is all about finding the reasons why you do what you do, right? And most of these reasons are driven in this angry phase. So hopelessness, uh, anger-based emotion. Right. Up here it's an anger based emotion, here it could be a pain, later on down the track you might feel it as a pain but it'll be completely different mm. the way you feel it. Up here you'll feel it like, oh no matter what I do it's never going to be any good anyway, oh, I feel pretty upset about that and angry about that, what's the point of acting anyway, might as well not act at all, that's all facade. A whole lot of that's, none of it's true, it's none, of the, none of it's the truth about your life, it's just how you feel in that moment justifying inaction. Yeah. So in other words, if I can connect with an anger that's behind the hopelessness, then that's that's an awareness. Yeah, exactly. That's the emotion you need to feel first. The anger. Oh, I feel really, uh, really angry that I've got to do something. Like, why do I have to do something? I, like, why do I have to do something? Someone else created my pain. This is what generally we feel. Someone, instead of realising that it's my sin that created it, I go, someone else created my pain and they helped me create my facade. They should have to bloody well do the whole thing themselves and should leave me alone. I shouldn't have to do this. How dare God make me do that? Mm. You know, these are feelings in that hopelessness that the hopelessness masks. You follow? Yeah. And when you get through those feelings, you feel, ah, there's all my justifications for the hopelessness. Right? And then when you release that, you go, wow, now that, I don't f now that I don't feel angry about those things anymore and justified in those things anymore, now I can see that actually I can understand self-responsibility a bit more. I can see, yeah, the way God created, it makes sense to me, the way God created things is that I am responsible and that I am responsible for deconstructing what I believe. And, and you get to that point. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so the key is to not judge yourself for that. See, see, remember, something that we all must, all must remember is the creation of our facade was a vicious, cruel process, along with the creation of our pain, of course. But the creation of our facade initially began with our parents t teaching us. And many times they didn't just teach us by example, they taught us by fist or you know, slapping or pain to do this. So there's a vicious, cruel process that created my facade. Of course, accepting it is a challenging thing. But I need to stop judging myself for having it so much when, when it was a vicious, cruel process that created it. You see, it's like, and we need to get to that stage where we're not so judgmental and so critical of ourselves about it. and We just see it for what it is. 
Yeah. Good question, Chris. Because it helps explain, you know, where we're at. You know, if we haven't got through this yet, we can't be feeling these things. We are feeling these things. Yeah. It's, our soul is built that way. You can't, you can't get to the next thing until you feel the thing on top of it. And uh, that's the way it is. And, and the key is to come to trust that process. And once you trust that process, everything gets a lot easier. You don't have to use your intellect as much. The feeling is there. You know the feeling of hopelessness, for example, is there. So you know that it's probably a facade-based emotion. What does it give you? What is justification? What drives it as a justification? And you, you'll feel things like I mentioned, you know, angry that you have to do it when other people created it or helped you create it and things like that. Angry with God for it being there and him allowing the whole thing to work the way it does and so forth. All these different things that we get angry about in this place and we just need to let ourselves have it let it go release it once we've released it we realize all sorts of things about self-responsibility care for self you know how important it is to feel emotion none of those things would be learnt if we didn't go through that process yeah powerful process thanks yeah. Um, if we go to Tara, thanks on this side, and Laura on this side, thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry. You, you, no, no. Go, go first. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks, Joyce. Um, just wondering if it's necessary to actually completely destruct my facade before I'm able to compensate for or, or re feel remorse for what I've actually created with my facade towards my children. Yes, you're asking about together. repentance and where that kicks in, right? Yeah. So, so the, issue, the real issue is um, you're going to have to completely accept your facade, otherwise you will not feel any, any valid feeling of repentance ever. Right? Number one. So remember, repentance is a divine love law. And that law cannot be engaged until you've accepted your facade. You just can't. So, and with the deconstruction of your facade, the majority of what I said about the acceptance also applies. And that is it's highly unlikely you enter repentance until most of your facade is deconstructed. And there are specific issues that allow opening to deeper emotions. So remember, this is not an all or nothing thing. So you find that you've deconstructed your facade in one area. You've gotten rid of your addictions in one area. And now, of course, some terror about that particular thing will start up. And you'll also start feeling some pain about that particular thing. But it doesn't mean it feels about everything. It's just about that particular thing that you've dealt with your addictions with and you've worked through some issues about. Does that make sense? And then another thing will come along and you realise, wow, I'm in total denial of that one. And then you'll have to work your way down through the process for that one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. And the, the key is God's always trying to expose, it make, make you feel open to what's going on. He's always trying to expose it. The laws are all there to expose. But, but we're in denial about a lot of things. So we didn't even understand the laws. So, so, you know, for me, I was in denial about my self-love for a long time before I started to become aware it was a major problem that I needed to address and I needed to get down into. Does that make sense? So, thank you. For uh, for some others, you're going to find love of others is a major problem, and you're in denial of it for a long time. Just depends on what emotions are quite large within oneself. So, for example, if you've been part of your pain as a child, it is that you were given everything, right? Whenever you wanted it, then you'll find that your love of others is going to be a major problem in terms of your facade. It's just going to be a major problem. It's going to take you years to get rid of it if you've been given everything as a child. Uh -huh. if, you, if you weren't given anything as a child, then it would be your love of self that would probably be more of a problem. That's going to take you years to get used to and get develop and work your way through. It just depends, you see, on what... Remember, the pain is the <laughs> addictions and the... Facade is all about feeding those, helping those addictions, making them look like they're not there or go away or the pain of it going away. So it depends what kind of pain was created as to there'll be a relationship between the kind of pain and the kind of facade that you have. 
But I'm saying to you also that the justification of the facade is a completely separate issue. There's one thing to have the facade for certain purpose, quite another to justify having it. And this is it. and where I see the majority of you struggling is the justification of having it. Not the actual facade itself, but its justification. And that's why these processes are a very important part of awakening to sin. Yeah. So Tara? Is um, being quite inconsistent, especially in parenting, um, whether it be setting boundaries or emotional inconsistency, that's basically addiction? Yeah. You, if, one thing, if one thing doesn't meet your addiction, you just find another thing and that makes you inconsistent. Okay. And you go from one thing to another thing until you're satisfied and then that's the thing you choose in that situation. And so the next time a situation comes along, if it's the same kind of situation, you'll, ch you'll go to that thing straight away and if that doesn't work, you'll then go <laughs> and you'll do something again differently, inconsistently. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so being aware that I've been like that for a long time and this morning realising mum, how mum and dad were so inconsistent, they weren't on the same page much. Yeah. And so really as a child, we just want the truth from our parents, right? Yep. So the truth was never consistent. The, was truth, is, the truth as a child is so safe. It's consistent, repetitive. It's like all of God's laws. This is what I, one of the things when we come to God's laws. All of God's laws are consistent, repetitive. And the reason why God has done that is so that we're not left guessing. It's very unloving to be left guessing all the time. Mm. And, and God's laws are consistent every time about the same thing. Right? We don't believe that, but, but they are. But man's laws are totally inconsistent, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they are. And, and, and parents' law is even worse. Yeah. Our parents' law it just depends on how they feel on the day, what's going on on the day, mum and dad are different, you know, what's feeling, what they're feeling. And so we learned as a child that you know, there are really no rules and you've just got to try to guess what the rules are at the, on the day and in the moment. That's what we learned. Very damaging to a child. So the best form of action would be to just work at what you feel the most loving um, boundary or way to be consistent is. At the if moment. You make, uh, yeah, and then if you make that mistake, and feel that. you do that, that consistently that. every time, every child, every time. So what am I doing consistently? Like the Once you've decision. worked out what your law is in your household that's based upon love, yeah. you do that consistently every child, every time. Yeah. <sighs> You see? Really but that's not going to feed some addictions. <laughs> and it's also probably going to confront some of the child's reactions, which Definitely. won't feed your addictions. And this is why we don't do it. We, we, we revert to other behaviour. But the problem with the other behaviour is you're teaching the child that there, are no, there is no consistent law. And the problem with no consistent law is that we're now confused. And this is why most of us as adults are totally confused. Because we don't know what we're going to do in any situation. So what we do is we start guessing. We try to... What's, what are they feeling? Oh, uh, I think they're feeling this. Uh, oh, that's what I'll do. Mm. You know. Oh, oh, they weren't feeling that. Oh, okay. Uh, what else do I do? I'll try another thing and so forth. It's, it's very disconcerting, actually, if you think about it. Very confusing and it actually creates fear. Yeah. Because we're, we're now afraid of determining what's right, what's wrong and so forth. Very, very confusing process. That's why I said in the first century, let your yes mean yes and your no no. Okay. Although Basic th rule of parenting. Well, I mean, <laughs> we have children to, you know, the kids, the adult, uh, teenagers pull me up for being inconsistent, but when we try to be consistent, they get angry. Of course, because so their addictions will now be triggered. By the time they're a teenager, they have all of these addictions of their own, Yeah. which, which you train them to have. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. And so their anger, in a way, is almost a compensatory effect for your training. Mm. But you're going to have to now learn to be consistent even through their anger. Yes. Yeah. And you don't want to do that because when they're angry with you, you feel bad about yourself and you feel, and there's another addiction, you see. Yeah. So <coughs> it's just like, yeah, the best rule of parenting, let your yes mean yes and you know no. Be consistent right across the board. Determine what you believe is loving and then consistently apply it to every child in every situation that that applies to. Just right across the board, just like God's laws do. Exactly the same as God's laws. You just be consistent. Now, if you determine uh, if in a year, two years' time that, that you were being unloving, you didn't understand love, sit down with them and say, look, 
what's happened is I've gone through a process and I've realised that this law that I've made is an unloving law. Yeah. And so I've got to get rid of it. We have done that t at times, yeah. Yep. yep. And then get rid of it consistently. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had one more. Yeah, I think. So. Yeah, yes, me. Yes, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Paul, and uh, if we come to Suzanne front here. Um, you said developing faith is such a, 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 an important part in, in this in both ways. And one thing you said earlier was that we're afraid to develop faith. And yes. I was just wondering w why that is. Faith will pull us through things that we don't want to go through. I, I understand that, but, but see for myself, if, if I... If you understood that, you wouldn't ask your question. So that's why we're afraid, because of what it'll bring up. It'll bring up the truth and, and uh, of our, where we're at and stuff like and that. And also yeah. expose our addictions that we have to not have faith. See, see many, mm. of our, many of our desires to not have faith are driven by the fact we want a certain thing. We want to do a certain thing. You know, we, we, want, we want to believe that someone else is responsible for how I feel. Right? So if I have faith in God's goodness, I have faith in God's laws, and I have faith in God's truth, and I work out that actually God's truth is, and I have faith in God's truth, that actually no one else is responsible for any of my emotions, then that's going to confront this addiction that I have where I'm trying to get other people to be responsible for my emotions. So naturally I don't want the faith under those circumstances because I, I want to be able to blame Another person for the fact that you know I'm feeling things that because of what they've done, so called. What is what I think? Yeah, it exposes all my stuff and yeah, and, yeah. and brings me into truth more. Yeah, that's right. And and the and the problem with that, of course, is that we go, oh goodness me, I can't, I can't fight the, you know, this feeling I have that I want them to be at fault, and my faith is telling me now I have faith in God's truth. I'm going, but it's wrong. <laughs> so what, what do I do about this conundrum now, right? If I still want the addiction, man, uh, it's going to confront that addiction, obviously, isn't it? So, so for a lot of us, we are terribly afraid of developing more faith. Most of us also ter terribly afraid of developing more faith because we know it's going to confront the status quo in the world. The average person on this planet does not have any faith in God, whether they're religious or not. They don't have any faith in God. And particularly they don't have any faith in a loving God. They might have faith in a punishing God or a wrathful God, but not in a loving God. And their very actions demonstrate that they don't have faith in a loving God. Right? And so there we are. We're starting to have faith in something that the rest of the world believes is false. And so is it like the more faith I develop, the more I could be attacked and the more vulnerable I'll be? And yeah, that's what we believe. It's not actually true in the long run, but that's what we believe. So there's another belief that gets triggered, you see. And most of us are addicted to survival, right? We, we are so afraid of someone killing us or whatever, or someone attacking us or abusing us, or even just thinking that we're a bad person, that, that you know, that, it's in itself goes, okay, I'm a bad person if I believe in God. So I'm better off, you know, hiding my faith. Or, and you can't hide faith, real faith. You can't hide it. So the trouble, so you're better off not getting it. This is what you think, you know. Better off not getting more faith because once you get a bit more faith, you won't be able to hide it. And then you'll do a whole heap of things and that will cause this snowballing effect of all these bad things that I imagine will happen. So yeah, we have a lot of fear about developing faith, Paul. Lots of fear. Real faith, you know. A faith that is in disharmony with the world we live in. Well, I think that's the biggest one for myself. It's like, my yeah. goodness, you know, I don't want to be out on my own, you know, yeah. um, and, um, and, and, and call to stand up, you know, in amongst, yeah. In amongst any situation. A attack or any whatever. Any situation. Yeah. Imagine. You might have a hundred people in a room and you're the only person standing up because you have faith in God's goodness and faith in love. You might be the only person. And for the average person, that just freaks the hell out of you. Just Even just being different to that degree, without even knowing whether you're going to get attacked or not. 
And this is why we have so much fear about developing faith. Yeah. And that's why we prefer cynicism. We prefer doubt. We prefer to avoid, you know, having to make a final decision. It's like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like a faith, faith causes you to make final decisions and final final motivations, final decisions. And and that's going to confront not only your own emotions, but everyone around you. <laughs> everyone around you. And most of us think confronting someone around us, that's a bad thing. Bad thing. Naughty boy for thinking that you can do such a thing and get away with it. Right? And the reality is God's encouraging us to do that with issues of love. But the world's saying, don't you dare. You dare do that, and we're going to be on your case. Right? We're going to, and on your case could be anything from just, just verbally abusing you, right around to chucking you in jail or, or throwing you in a mental asylum for having a certain belief or feeling. Very, very damaged world we live in. Right? So we've got to see that, yeah, there's an internal motivation of fear-based motivation for the majority of us to not develop faith. Yeah. And yet faith is the very thing that we're going to need to even begin the deconstruction process. Because if we don't believe there's a motivation for doing it, we just won't do it. We just won't. It's a good question, Paul. Where are we over here, Laura? Yep. Um, so when it comes to having a relationship with God, um, I know I've heard you mention before that you have to deal with certain, um, like the emotions that block you to God first. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the facade, is that basically all of the facade? Pretty much. Yeah, right. All of your addictions block you to God in different ways. Yeah. You know, they, they all block you to, and, it, and you'll find as you start moving through different addictions and releasing the actual the damaged belief of getting away with it <laughs> with each addiction once you release that you'll start to feel smidges of god's love occasionally yeah, yeah. in when you ask for it of course you'll start to feel it because there's now not those addictions and those beliefs blocking the flow of love anymore does that yeah, make sense yeah. so this is a growing awareness process so sometimes you have an awareness in one area and none in another yeah so and it's just a, like a gradual sort of yeah yeah okay. yeah so the, the end goal, remember, of the deconstruction of the facade is to get to this point, isn't it? Yeah. Where you're sensitive to your own pain and you're prepared to feel any emotion, including terror. Yeah, yeah. That's the end goal. And once that happens, you'll actually feel your terror and then you'll start feeling the pain-based emotions one after the other. Yeah. You know? And often, like I said, there's... You might get through the entire process with one emotion while at the same time being in denial with another. Yeah, right. Yeah? yeah. But the more of that you do, the more pain gets exposed, the more pain gets released, the more you change. The more you change at the soul level, the more you attract more beautiful events. And you also, when you have a longing for God's love, the more you receive that. And so things after that, you notice things getting better. But when you're up here, you know, you're standing on the precipice of all of your you know, facade and you're looking at all of your addictions and you're going, where in the hell do I start <laughs> you know, <laughs> dealing with this crap that I've got in me? And, and, but you've now accepted it. You know, you've now got through judgment and those kind of emotions and you're now accepting, this is what I got, but <laughs> where do I go from here? That, that's a very, it's quite, it is quite a scary place. And, and in that place also, you know, you can see, you can already have, you already have some awareness of how it's stopping your relationship with God, how it's stopping your sincerity. Because it, it, the facade's very insincere. Yeah. So it's all just about selfish desires and demands. That's all it's about. Not much love in it, right? Not any really, is there? Because it, it's all based on a lie. So there's no love in it. It's just all. So give me this, give me that, give me this, give me that. Give me that thing, give me that, give me, give me that, give me that thing, give me that. You know, like that's how we feel. It's like, <laughs> have you heard that song? Yeah. <laughs> that's what we like with everything. It's like, give me, give me, give me, give me. And that, that's the facade at work, you see, mm -hmm. avoiding a whole heap of emotions. And so when you get to the sin, like the original 
sin is that in that place when you're willing to actually feel that after you've gone through that once you feel the pain you will be aware exactly of what caused that pain yeah whether that was a sin of somebody else or your own sin <coughs> so yeah and is that where god can help you when you're well no it's god's helping you through the entire process oh, is yeah, he not okay yeah yeah you know, he's helping you get out of denial with the laws and everything. He's helping you realise what your addictions are he's with the laws and everything. He's helping you see that there's a facade and what's going on. He's helping you see you've got a lot of terror inside of you. There's certain events through the laws that get triggered and you feel the terror and then you run away from it. So, so he's saying, he, and particularly here, he's helping you a lot to see here's another false belief you have about love. Here's another false belief you have about truth. And so forth. He's helping you see all the way through. It's not like it's. It's not like you got to get through all this, and then God says, "Okay, I'll accept you now." Oh, awesome. <laughs> so God is my friend. Yeah, He's not like saying, "I'm your enemy until you deal with this." <laughs> That's it, Laura. I'm not, I'm not having none of you till you deal with this. He, he's trying to assist you. He's very, and you'll learn this in the law discussion that we have. His very universe has been designed to redeem you. Right, and to bring you joy and happiness, the, all the you can't even function without God's laws. You you can't even live without God's laws. The fact that you're alive right now is all because of God's laws. Well, you think about it. Just the law of gravity, isn't it? Isn't that how you can actually stand on this earth and walk around? Yeah. And if if the law of gravity did not exist, you'd be dead within a few seconds. <laughs> All of God's laws are supporting your very existence. And that includes these highest laws, the laws relating to the soul. You follow? Yeah. Yeah. So wonderful. So wonderful. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, what have we got? Well, that actually, I probably should finish. I'm way. Oh, no, no. I'm, uh, it's a 420 day. I've got eight minutes. Lani. <laughs> Elaine, sorry. Oh, sorry, Suzanne was next, was it? Yeah, sorry, Suzanne. Far away. Oops. I had the realisation that, that I always thought that terror was really bad fear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair <laughs> enough. And I realised today it's not. So what is terror? Well, that's what we want to discuss with you more, isn't oh. it? Obviously, we need to see what it's all about, and I've already given you indications of what it's about. It's about just a general global terror about you being you. Okay. So, it's so you think about you at the moment, Suzanne. You just don't want to be you. You know that you know. If you look at the you look at the chi your childhood, you can see why you don't want to be you. Every time you were you, you got suppressed, hammered, punished, abused emotionally, verbally, sometimes physically. <laughs> Who'd want to be you after that? Yeah. Nobody wants, and that's why none of us really want to be us, because there's all these terrible things that have happened to us in the attempt to be us, right? And that, that's a large part of this terror. This terror you feel when you go through it, you won't care what it is, and that's what I'm getting at. You'll just feel it. So you see, wanting to know what it is is an indication you still don't want to feel it. Because once you get through that place, you'll just go through the physical of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you won't be analysing it and dissecting it and intellectually working out where it came from and none of those things. And in fact, like I said to the majority of you, you won't even know how to do that because the terror itself, when you're experiencing it, you're not in an intellectual place where you're thinking about it. You, 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 can, you can barely function when you're in that place, like, let alone think. Mm -hmm. So you're just going to be feeling it. That's all you need to do. You don't have to work it all out. You just need to feel it. You're wanting to work it out so that you don't have to feel it. Okay. Does that make sense? So it's the result of things that actually happened? Well, not necessarily to oh. you. Remember I said it could be the result of things that have happened to the previous generation or the oh. previous generation. Yeah, it might not be right. to you. This is why your intellectual guesses about what it is is pointless. Oh. Because yeah. you don't know what it is, you, you just got to be get to the point where you're willing to feel it, and you're not at that point yet. Yeah. So, so you just got to get to that point. The way you get to that point is removing all of your addictions that cloud it, yeah. that cloud it, uh, cover it, that prevent you from having to feel it. You get rid of them, and now you touch it. 
start touching it, it freaks you out a bit. But then once you develop your will, you get to the point where oh, I, can, I naturally go into it, just feel it. And it will be a short, intense period of time in your life. And once you're over it, you'll now be in the individual system, the individual beliefs, the individual pains, the individual fears. But you won't have that global terrified feeling anymore. You won't wake up in dread anymore. You'll, some days you'll wake up feeling bad because another fear has come up, but you won't wake up consistently every day like this. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the key, the key is when we're asking a lot of questions about this, good indication we're not there yet. So we're better off asking questions about this. You see? And what I notice you doing is you're always asking me questions about this. And you very rarely, if ever, ask me any questions about this. Mm, it's true. And that the reason why we do that is because this is your safety net. This is this is what has to be deconstructed before you feel that. And internally, there's almost a knowledge of that. You know, don't don't ask about addictions because they'll expose what I'm afraid about. You follow? Yeah. yeah. And that's why we don't ask. Yeah. I, I do feel that I understand it a lot more after these two yeah, days. So that's good. Yeah, that's you. good. Um, where were we? We're back at uh, Elaine, up the back. Just to do, um, not actually about what Suzanne was just asking, mm -hmm. but on the back of us refusing to feel our emotion of terror, or emotion of a lot of other things, then you've mentioned before that women particularly have a lot of pressure on them to be in facade or use facades, you know, to be nice. No, looking. I was referring to specific facades. Okay. Right? Women have a lot of pressure. Men have pressure as well. Right? Don't think that just because you're a woman it's worse for you. Oh, no. Oh, oh, I wasn't, but I was. <laughs> no, see, <laughs> Maybe see I was. again, see, you don't even know Sorry. your motivations, Elaine. Your motivations are for this is how most women feel. Women have a harder life than men. You feel that. It's a motivation for your question, actually. You believe women have a harder life than men. Okay, so my question was if we work through those things. I just told you one of your addictions, but go on. And yeah, I, it hit me right here. No, it didn't, but go on. <laughs> no, it didn't hit you at all. I won't. But go yeah, on. Sorry. I don't want to say Stop like trying I'm to debating. fake it with me. I can feel what's going on. <laughs> so just get on with your question. That's all. Um, I've been burning to ask for ages yeah. if once we get through those things, would we then, um, and historically I haven't used a lot of these things myself, but would we then be able to um, use things like, hair colour, tattoo, makeup, jewellery, etc., and not be in facade, just expressing something. That's now, can I ask you a question, Elaine? Let's imagine for a moment you're 25, you're nice and slim, you've you got no, no wrinkles or anything, your hair's its natural colour, and, and there's no wrinkles on your face, and you look radiant. Do you think you're going to want makeup? That's exactly what I thought, but <laughs> other people have been saying, no, no, it's this or it's that. Or yeah, do you think you're going to need jewellery to embellish it all? Particularly jewellery that had to be mined, had to yeah. destroy the environment to get, had to, would you, do you think you're going to need it under those circumstances or even want to? It would be wonderful if we didn't. Probably not, right? But you don't know what you're going to want then. So stop trying to guess what you're going to want then and just get on with this. <laughs> and I told you the thing earlier about the thing that's stopping you. And, you and that, that is my addiction to want to jump to the future. And yeah, and I see many of you doing that to avoid all sorts of things in this area here. And in fact, many of you are asking about future potentials for yourself in order, it's one of your addictions, in order to avoid how you feel about yourself right now. And, and this is one of the addictions. Like, like one thing I've said to Mary is, look, darling, you get, if, if I'm getting a bit tubby about, around my waist, stop picking on me about it. <laughs> I'm just going through something. I'll be done with it sooner or later. Right? Don't have to pick on me about it. I, you don't have to pick on yourself about this derriere getting, <laughs> getting large. Right? You don't. 
thanks for the reminder because yeah, that I feel that I'm harder done by. Yeah. Then then men I thought perhaps I had the feeling I'm harder done by than a lot of other women, but that's a good reminder, thank you. Yeah. The reality is there are emo there's emotional damage that's been inflicted upon men and there's emotional damage that's been inflicted upon women and some of a woman's emotional damage is easier to release than some of a man's emotional damage. And remember, if a, if a person's been abusive in their life, which many men have, they're going to have much worse emotions to address than a woman who has been the receiver of the abuse. So the reality is, many men have a much more difficult time than women do because they've been more abusive on the planet than women have. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So. Thank you so much. Okay, well, that brings us to our conclusion today. Hopefully you've learnt some things today. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, very good. Thanks. Good. Good. <coughs> I really enjoyed having a chat with you today. It was so good that you quite you stayed open the whole day, which is uh, very, very good. And, and more of a sort of investigative feeling today. Very good. This is what we need to maintain. Tomorrow's going to get a bit tricky, but just if you can maintain that <laughs> investigative feeling, you'll be fine. You'll breeze your way through it. Yeah. <laughs> and is there anything, yep, Ivana, you would like to, not related to the event? I just wanted to say I've really enjoyed, like, I wanted to say thank you to um, both of you guys for addressing us about our questions because yep. I've definitely found it much more enjoyable, like, with this assistance group compared to the previous one. Yes. Um, just with how the questions are flowing now and yeah. um, it's like we can cover a whole lot more stuff rather than having all the stories and exactly. all that crap. And, and isn't it much more so, pleasant to be here yeah. when the questions are more about principles yep. than stories? You're not yeah. just going, oh, here goes another story. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to zone out for 18 minutes while that person, you know what I mean? Yep. Yeah, yeah, so thank you, guys. Yeah, so it's wonderful. Uh, yeah, we felt it was a necessary thing we needed to do just to improve the love in the groups. And, uh, and while initially it might have been a bit confronting us bringing up those things, I'm sure you're going to experience the benefits of having more direct questions, more straightforward questions based on principle rather than stories. And that's why we've attempted to address those issues. We felt we, felt we were letting you get away with too much in your addictions. <laughs> And it, isn't it interesting? You stop the addictions even in a group and all of a sudden the group mood also feels less uh, exhausted, less, less uh, dragging and exhausting. And this is the beauty of addressing truth, you see? See, this is one of the benefits. This should build some faith for you. One of the benefits of addressing truth is that everybody who's involved feels better afterwards. Really good. So this is a great thing. So yeah, my feelings are we're going to attempt to do that and keep refining things from our perspective to, to help the groups really start to flow. And, and in the end, like I feel, um, you know, you look at the first few groups where I just let people get away with murder, really. Um, almost <laughs> murder, <laughs> not quite. But where, you know, if you look back years ago, you know, how much of it was like, oh, here we go, <laughs> go again, you know. And, and often I was feeling that as well. They go, here we go again. And I've got to say something here. Where once also we have more self-love, we, we feel like, no, this is not why we're here. We're not here to listen to your stories and feed your stories and feed your addictions. We're here to help you understand God's way and how to embrace it. And the best way to do that is by, you know, helping confront the addictions in place and, and, and you being so, like I feel in this group today particularly, you, you're being really good about being willing to do that. Right, and there are other times when you're not so good about it, but <laughs> you can address those. You know, it depends what subjects come up, doesn't it? Sometimes, and how confronted we are. But uh, but what we're going to do is try to maintain this uh, basic general feel for for the rest of our group. So so hopefully you'll find them more free flowing, more interesting, and instead of zoning out when people are asking questions, you'll find the question process quite engaging as well, which is what our hope is too. Darling, you'd like to say. 
Just to thank everyone for standing up today. Yeah, the no, new, it's much the better. New arrangement yeah. and yeah, good for the camera people. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Much better for the cameras. Yeah. Much better. It'll it'll play out much better on the actual recording as well. So we'd like to thank you for cooperating with us today about that issue. Thanks, guys. Well, we'll we'll let you free now. You can go and uh, play uh, with those addictions as much as you want. <laughs> and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> thank you.